I'd just also love to acknowledge this morning's sessions with the amazing three curators. Um, I thought that was, a, I think, such a unique uh, moment for us to have that level of access to the two exhibitions uh, that you see on level four to, um, today. Um, so, in acknowledging uh, the importance and value of how these two, how, of how past does quiet and seismography of uh, struggle live alongside each other, um, and to further contextualize the critical curatorial interventions into art historical archives that they both do um, and propose, we have invited uh, four Cape Town-based thinkers and multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary in their practices um, uh, whose own approaches to the creative, political, and poetic uses of the archive offer a diversity of perspectives, uh, engagements, as well as interventions. Um, and so just to clarify, we have created this uh, uh, session as a roundtable uh, format. It is a dialogical uh, moment in our program today in which our four participants will exchange a lot, you know, with, my, with prompts from myself as uh, a facilitator during the session. Um, and the round table is structured as a moment um, really to center the potential, um, the potentially innov innovative stakes of working and making with archives. Uh, particularly as it will be located in the dynamic projects that each participant has identified from their practice and that they will elaborate on today in conversation with each other. Um, but before I, uh, we continue, I do feel it is important for me to um, offer their biographies, just so we know specifically uh, who we're, we're in conversation with. Um, firstly, to my left is Connie Benson, who is an, a historian, organizer, and educator. She is a lecturer in the Department of History at the University of the Western Cape. Her research focuses on collective interventions and histories of contested development and the mobilization, demobilization, and remobilization of struggle history in Southern Africa's past and present. Uh, Benson is co-convener along with Mavish Ahmed, Hannah Mag uh, Morgestern, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, of the Revolutionary Papers Pro Project, which launched in 2019. Uh, the Revolutionary Papers Project, which she will obviously expand on a bit more soon, is a transnational research collaboration exploring anti-colonial per periodicals uh, from across the Global South, which has remarkable resonance, resonance with Zahia Rahmani's seismog seismography of struggle in this moment. Um, and secondly, we have Wushle Ngaba, who is a multi-award winning South African actor, writer and speaker. Her research and uh, performance interests include developing new thought processes around the role of storytelling and creativity in unearthing and amplifying African women's voices from the archive to inspire new narratives and push the boundaries of performance. Currently, she is researching and curating the Southern Women's Archive, an extensive collection of photos, personal letters, journals, books, essays, manuscripts, internal correspondence, and minutes of women's meetings from across the world, inherited from her own great aunt, Ruth Mompati, one of the first women soldiers of Umkonto Wesizwe, and founding member of the Federation of South African Women, established in 1954. So a deeply personal residence in the work that we is doing there. Um, thirdly, we have George Mahashe, who operates within the wider field of photography, particularly at the intersection of anthropology, archives, and artistic practice. Mahashe holds a PhD in fine art from the University of Cape Town, where he lectures as part of the Michaela School of Fine Art. His research interest focuses on Limpopo Province's Balubedu people and their constituent Constitu constitutionally neglected language, whose use of mythology and rumor evaded colonial manipulation and representation practices in innovative ways. 
He is particularly drawn to the idea of a camera obscura as a relief from photography's difficulty to escape from European representation practices. I have a close uh, affinity to George's work myself as a keen photography uh, scholar and researcher. Um, that's where my interest lies in terms of the archive as well. So I'm excited to, for you all to hear more about the specificity of George's work there. Um, uh, and then uh, lastly, we have Amu Khelang Maledu, who is an interdisciplinary art practitioner who developed her critical theoretical ba background in visual and cultural studies by creating a specific link with art criticism and archival research. Her research interests include, include re-reading archives and colonial collections in contemporaneous ways. Maledu is a team member of Creative Knowledge Resources and has worked with the Public Arts Festival hosted by the University of Cape Town's Institute for Creative Arts and Iziko South African National Gallery. She is currently a sitting member on UCT's Works of Art Committee, which is responsible for the art curation and acquisitions of the university, and has served as the curatorial assistant for the South African Pavilion at the 58th Venice Biennale 2019. Currently, she is a sessional lecturer and convener at UCT's Art History Department. Again, Am Khalang insists that she is an interdisciplinary uh, practitioner, but I am particularly interested in her curatorial insight as well from, in terms of archival pursuits. Um, so to jump right in, um, what I have done for this round table in, to prepare our participants is to begin to ask them to respond to an initial prompt. So we're not really working or, th or working with a set of questions that I have some somehow formulated and uh, that I'm asking our speakers to field. No, um, we're, I'm offering a, a set of prompts that relate to the specific projects that I asked our speakers to identify that may relate to their own um, uh, lived, ongoing, past and uh, future uh, investigations into archives and, and their uses uh, in their practice. Um, and so for the first prompt, the prompt I've offered, um, is one where I was inviting them to think about the relational nature of their respect, respective approaches to archival investigation. Um, in what way could you each, um, or could you each possibly find a way to relate a transformative or somewhat affective encounter within a moment in which you were inquiring an archive or a collection in your practice and how you may have been confronted with with that kind of almost what I have now thought about as a kind of a seismic shift um, that might occur uh, when we um, meet an archive, uh, gain access to it, uh, investigate it, pursue a thread and then suddenly something else emerges um, that shifts um, our relation to that archive and what we hope to do with it um, and the stakes that it now poses um, to you. So Connie, sure. So each um, presenter will have something to, to share visually. So we can go to Connie's PowerPoint. There we go, and you go. There we go. Okay, yeah, so I was, I was thinking about this question um, that Tacho gave us uh, with a little heads up. Uh, <laughs> and I, I wanted just to talk actually about the archive I've worked with for a very long time around the history of Crossroads. And for some people here, we're very involved and know very well the history. And maybe for some people who um, are new to Cape Town or South Africa, Crossroads, um, there were 3.8 million forced removals during apartheid. And um, in Cape Town, Crossroads was the only successful uh, resistance. So it can be said to be the longest standing informal settlement, African uh, informal settlement in Cape Town. Um, and uh, women got together uh, and created a women's committee um, and organized links to form a kind of local, national, and international struggle. Um, and so from having about 100 people at uh, intersection between two main roads, Lansdowne and Clipfontaine Road at the crossroads on this field that was designated to be a 
a, we, uh, a, a space to put people in a transit camp and then send them to whatever supposed appropriate Bantustan um, in, in, in the project of segregating Cape Town and appropriating land, um, people in Crossroads refuse to move. And so there's a, there, there's a lot of archives. And this is just a snapshot of um, posters and um, photographs that were in the newspaper, affidavits from court cases, uh, music, journals, um, and then you can see the one photograph there with the little 44 that's backward that gives you a hint that it's from a slide show. And this was from white women involved with the black sash putting on a slideshow in Kenilworth Mall to say, don't demolish crossroads. Um, 22 US uh, men in the US Congress stood up and said, don't demolish crossroads. So it was an international struggle. Um, and so with all of these kind of material remnants that are spread out across private and public archives, um, one of the things that sort of stood out for me is I did uh, 60 life histories with women involved, going back to look for the key organizers asking, what, what of this history now? Um, and in doing that, a lot of those interviews were then put up on the Aluka digitalization of Southern African liberation struggle project archive. It's now on JSTOR. And um, because that was put out, so these are the interviews that are up there of Jane Yanta, Daisy Baca, etc. And from here, I got an email out of the blue. Um, and it was a really interesting email because of all of the um, various protest methods, there were vigils, there were marches, there were petitions. But one, one activity that was quite different is that Women in Crossroads created a play um, in a moment um, after one of the many, many raids. Um, and people were very stressed. And they started almost playing with each other and pretending. Someone was actually just taking trash out from her self-made structure. And someone else said, where are you going? And she said, oh, I'm about to be demolished. Save me from the bulldozer. And people started playing. And women who were involved with the Black Sash then sent a drama teacher, oh, we can help you. This can be a great play. You can put it on. And they were like, we don't need a drama teacher. And they chased the drama teacher away. And they started creating this performance. And they added to it. As the negotiations with the state, they would add more characters. Women played all the roles, including the roles of men. There were children who got to be the dogs. But other than that, it was an all-woman cast. And they traveled. They traveled to from Crossroads, Soweto, Dimbaza. But then after a while, they did uh, want to put this on on stages in space theater, in market theater. And so then they, they did um, get help with lighting and whatnot. So in one of the stories in some of these interviews, they were speaking about the play. And in speaking about the play, women often said, this play is keeping my memory alive because to tell you the history of Crossroads, I just have to think of the play. And then everything that unfolded in the play, I can tell you about it. And I got an email from a woman in occupied Palestine. She's like, I'm writing to you from Israel. And I was that drama teacher they chased away. Wow. And then I came back and I was helping with the lighting and I have a script. So we recreated the script. Um, and so I eventually I wrote a PhD thesis. It's 500 pages long. And it's the most number of pages until you have to bind in two copies. And the reason for that is that of these 60 life narratives, even to narrow down what you can put in of people speaking for themselves is quite limiting. And if you ever go to write a journal article or a book, people will say, can't you just paraphrase this? You know? So it's very long, and it's meant to be another form of an archive. But of course, it's 500 pages long, so five people have read it. And eventually, um, I turned it into a graphic novel working with artists and with activists in ongoing struggles for housing in Cape Town, because this is not history. And 1994 didn't change much in terms of land redistribution. So uh, here's the book and how it got changed. And the reason I tell you this is it's in how you turn those oral histories um, back into images and then into words and texts. And in many ways, the comic book is a retroactive photo album. So there are tons of archives. And then at the same time, there's no archives. And mm. I, I think it resonates with um, what Russia was speaking about, about the oral histories. I hope that's not me. No. Um, and then a young women's group in Philippi of activists, feminist activists, were really exhausted from all the organizing they were doing for food and against gender-based violence during um, COVID. And they decided that it would be um, 
a good idea to start a reading group. And we thought we'd meet once, and we met every week for almost, for months and months and months, reading the book together, the comic book together. And the, the, the second kind of sentence that came up around these archives was this idea that reading the book has given us confidence that we live where we like. Because the book is called Crossroads, I Live Where I Like, which comes from Biko's column, I Live Where I Like, under, he wrote under the pseudonym Frank Talk. Um, and this idea that I write what I like as a single author, and Women in Crossroads, I Live Where I Like, as a collective writing of history in that way. And so what Guaita Wenena then said is, this bringing a shack, in the play they put up a shack on stage, and she was saying this is like when we put up a shack at UCT, in the middle of UCT and it was the most offensive thing, the state was called in, etc. And she said, we're serious, this is our land and we want all of it. So I think that this moment of going from the interviews to written text to emails sent from afar back into um, various forms for me is an important way that the archives need to be enacted um, and used yeah. to create ongoing stories. So I'll end at that. Thank you, Connie. And I think already that picks up on what I also pointed out, um, or what I picked up on in reading your bio, or at least in terms of um, what you speak of as the mobilization demobilization and remobilization of struggle history that your research has mostly been concerned with. Could you perhaps, um, before we you know, continue and, and get um, uh, responses as well, is, is um, could you differentiate mm -hmm. those three pillars that seem to yeah. function in your practice? I mean, what was really interesting is in going to look for the core women who had been involved, Crossroads is also, in a way, a famous story. On the ANC website, they say, thank you to the women of Crossroads. Meanwhile, the women of Crossroads, they were not ANC particularly. Mm -hmm. um, they also weren't part of any of the official women's movements. They were a women-only group, but they were organizing for um, basic services for all. It was a community-based group. And so in a way, their history is radical, but it's freeze-framed in time. Mm -hmm. Um, and very disconnected from what's going on now. So the politics of it have been taken apart. Um, so, you know, we can take down a statue of Van Riebeck and put up a statue of Mandela, but where are the kind of um, politicized interventions? And so the demobilization came in many forms in Crossroads, in part what happened to Crossroads, but in part what happened to those histories. And back in the archives at UCT, in manuscripts, I found a commission of inquiry into a four-month occupation, a sit-in, mm -hmm. by the Women's Power Group in Crossroads in 1998 um, for city housing. And nobody, in years of doing daily conversations with people in Crossroads, spoke about it because these two moments had been completely disconnected. And it was like, oh, the anti-apartheid organizing is fine to talk about as something past, but the ongoing organizing isn't. And so I think that those moves of demobilizing are quite dangerous and the depoliticization of these histories that we really need. So for me, the remobilization then is how do we insert them back into ongoing histories, sure. which I think the reading group and working with activists and different organizers can possibly do. Mm -hmm. So that would be those three categories. That's amazing. That's, uh, I think for me, the graphic uh, book also, the graphic language, the graphic image that you've created out of the archive, um, that specific story narrative is also another remobilization. Um, any responses so far? Again, this is really a, a way for our participants to also respond to each other's practices in particular ways. I definitely have things to say, but yeah. I'm busy breathing here because I'm like, <laughs> it's know. my turn next, it's my turn next. <laughs> I hear so you. I, I hear I you. So we say for sure. Let's not leave you in suspense any longer. Yes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Okay. Sure. Hi everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, can we start off, please, by getting me tub video one? Thank you. <laughs> I think I'll watch it with all of you. Sure. Sure. Actually, we can Why swap not? seats if you want. It's all good. For more movement of access. Hi guys. 
Guys, turn up the volume. And this is me chatting chats when I still thought I would film this this way. Then editing defeated me and showed me flames. So now we're going to do it my way, which is 100% mixed masala DIY. Um, anyhow, I go by the untamed bard. Look, I can't really take credit for the title. I was crowned as such in the newspaper feature about all of my work a few years ago and it stuck. I suppose the first obvious associations are I work in and around Shakespeare translations, rethinking and reimagining his relevance in the African continent and I do. More importantly, I'm an untamable black woman storyteller. I love many forms. This is me in the one woman show I wrote, Swan Song. This is me in an extract of a production I'm currently writing and researching that I'm really excited about. And this is the production I finished writing last year on Charlotte Matlake that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, this is me in the cast. Yay. <laughs> Love that um, the production was actually based on the PhD research of Dr. Tozama April entitled Theorizing Woman, the Intellectual Contributions of Charlotte Matlake to the Struggle for Liberation in South Africa. So the crazy story here is that my mother, who you just saw in the previous slide, and this is um, my great aunt, also my gran, um, anyway, she was actually, my mother was working on her own PhD on her great aunt Ruth Montati and had included Dr. April's PhD as a significant part of her research. Here's Dr. April and I in King Williamstown as I was completing the final act. And this is my mother's application to into the Maimuya archive in 2018 for her research. And cut to 2023 and this is me in the Maimuya archive. I'm doing research for a digital curatorial um, fellowship residency that I'm doing alongside performing, writing, all my other jobs. This is me in the my Wea Art Archive, which is also ridiculously incredible. Um, shout out to Orms for the camera. Thank you for the Osmo. Um, so basically, I spend a lot of time looking and engaging with old things and asking them for permission to either reinvent them or to tell their stories. I like to play. I'm in the process of making something new and I hope that um, it'll be available to all of you. So keep a lookout. And thank you for watching and joining my crazy world. I really love creating it and um, yeah. Thank you for being here. Let's make more. Let's have a good time. Let's unearth the archive. <laughs> okay. Um, if you could take me to right at the bottom, the picture that says archive. The way I've listed them, numbered them. In the meantime, I will continue. Yes, please. This is a production that cuts through time. I know, I know, most productions promise to do that, but this one has a couple of elements that really guarantee it. For one thing, I'm still writing it, see, script. And for another thing, all of you are here in this present moment, so I guess you're some part of helping me finish it. Someday. Not this day, I don't think. That's what the comma in the title is for, for those of us who attempt to carry on, to keep going, to catch the legacy as it falls from wide open birth. I'm just a single dangling piece of thread in this tapestry, just trying to piece it all together. The before that had my mother in it. The before before that contained my grandmothers. Their story is so intimately interwoven with that of my home country, South Africa, that I couldn't possibly tell the story of one without the other. In this case, I suspect that the process is always going to be more important than the end result. The scrummaging through the archives and making meaning, memories, stories, the making of whole people. The audience walks into what feels like a warehouse with a cacophony of electrical cords. You can, ah, I can click myself actually. Yes, is what I can do. There you go. 
Open. The audience walks into what feels like a warehouse with a cacophony of electrical cords, collages upon collages of photos, string, masking tape, holding together maps and letters, a spillover of archive. The action plays out in the round. The lowest stage is set up for a state funeral. Chairs for an entire nation go into the audience. The production uses the entire stage from the boards to the gods. A cyclone at the back of the stage acts as a projector and a podium is downstage with a huge microphone on a stand. A large wooden coffin hangs center stage as a chandelier covered in a South African flag. The stage has several levels. For example, the coffin moves up and down, its doors open and shut, etc. I'll pause there for now. Alrighty, um, I played the video just because I thought it might be a little bit easier so that you can understand the world that I come from. My name is Pushlangaba. I make several things. So a couple of years ago, I inherited this archive. Look, it doesn't look like this anymore, I promise. But I also can't promise that it looks very sexy. <laughs> um, but I'm working on it. Um, when I inherited this archive, it was really intimidating, obviously, because I kept thinking to myself, how am I going to approach this? How am I going to make? My mother, as I told you in the video, she was writing a book, a PhD rather, but I knew that for me to honor the stories, I can't do what it is that she's going to do because the point is, I'm a performer and I'm a maker. So now my question that I'm looking at always is, how do I use storytelling? What, do, what does the archive want to tell me? What I just read from um, is actually a script that I'm working on at the moment. And I'm working on it at in the My We archive now, because what's been crazy is, I've got my own resources at home, right, that I explore. I go to the Maibuye archive and I find correlating resources that then help me write the story even more. So here, I didn't realize that what I was actually proposing last year at my residency in Basel was that I was creating installations. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would photocopy a whole lot of my own archive. I took it with me to Switzerland. Then I just started building, 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 building. So the idea now is, I go to the Maibuye archive this year, for example. One of the posters, you can't see it here, but there's a poster, how do you describe it? What is it before posters made? Like a prototype, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yes, so in the archive, I actually discovered a prototype of my own one, sorry, a prototype of a poster for a woman's march um, in Finsbury Park in London in 1987. Mm -hmm. But this year, I actually found pictures of Angela Davis and Ruth Mompati in Namibia earlier that year in 1987 at a Diamond Workers Mine Convention, which then makes me go, oh, okay, cool. So they met there. That's where they must have decided to do the work. So that means that, oh, it's part of my story. So, for example, my aim is at the end of this year, hopefully, if all of the things go as they should, I will be telling a version of the story in the Maiwe archive. Because for me, I suppose that speaks to space again, right? Public space, what it actually means. The reason that I'm so anxious to be speaking here because it's a museum. <laughs> um, so it's me looking to reawaken the archive. That's so crazy. Let me keep going. See, that's why you guys were actually at the funeral now. <laughs> What I love about this method, um, to be honest with you, is because yeah. the person that I'm looking at, actually, no, that's not true. I'm looking at a family. But because of Ruth, it means that I am looking at 23 years of a person being all over the world. So the idea is, I'd love to go to New York, for example, and be like, what did she do there? And trace her there. And then tell the script from there, in that place. I don't want to limit myself to just theaters. I want to be able to visit everywhere. Alrighty, can we please play tab video two? I promise it's shorter. Hi all, my name is Bushen Gaba, AKA the Untamed Bard, and welcome to Triggers of the Future, an exhibition curated by myself and Babala Solwandle at my Mule Archive. That's her, and I have to thank Sis Babala for having extended this invitation to me to create something in response to June 76 to present and the digital archive assistants who were so supportive the whole way. I accepted the challenge because a few months earlier, 
I attended the Unboxing My Boy Strategic Workshop at Robben Island Museum and I kept hearing everyone speaking about unboxing the archive, but I wanted to go at actually doing it as an artist. At the workshop, I was most excited by listening to Lionel Davis speak about the role of art and the practice of That's Lionel. making within resistant movements. This, in combination with hearing Baba Hamilton Budaza speak at a CHR archive workshop about his time as a student at CAP and how the Community Arts Project workshops were an opportunity to be exposed to other art mediums, really inspired me. To me, all of this speaks to how media making or Art could also be described as meaning-making, so I decided that I wanted us to curate the sort of exhibition that would invite participants to take part, to make meaning for themselves. I'm really excited to be sharing these videos to walk you through the exhibition, as well as the process of curating it. Shout out to Orms for the camera, CHR for the research platform, Maibuya for the welcome and shout out to you, the audience, physical or digital. I'm so glad to have you here. More soon, promise. Sharp. <laughs> Alrighty, so I wanted to speak about this because this is what I've been working on over the last month. As I mentioned in the video, and I think that this is so important, I was invited by Sis Babalwa to do this thing, you know. It's not like I went there with that as a plan. I went there with my own plan, but I think I say this because I worked with some of Kony's students actually last week. So I had about 200 students that I worked with. Sorry, let me go this way. And we created posters, which was really, really incredible. But the point is I actually used the Community Arts Project workshop posters as triggers for them to create their own posters. The trick was we only had 20 minutes to do this. And so it was an opportunity, though, for me to be able to go, okay, Shap, you guys are learning about protest action right now. Let's go. You better go. And then the wonderful thing is something great happens where when you say to people, come, make something, they get so intimidated. So I go, education is not just about, yes, it is all of this we know, but it's also about being brave enough to imagine and to make things. And I know that for me with the students, what I was really excited about was to see them then start to engage in the making. So for example, I knew that they had had a lecture on the TRC and I was just saying to Kony, we did this incredible thing where they come in and I said to them, okay, shop, let's make, let's go. They looked at me blank. Then I was like, okay, you guys learned about the TRC. What did you learn? Blank again, fine. Then I was like, I know we don't really have time, but I'm gonna act like I have time, let's talk. And then I said to them, do you not know what you think? And they said, yeah, to be honest, I'm not sure if actually the TRC did anything. So that's why one of the posters says, for example, truth, question mark, remember TRC. Another one of them says, we are not sure TRC worked and what exactly did it achieve from 2023. So what's exciting about this is that it's going to join the exhibition at Maibuye. So we've got 200 students who are going to be able to come in and go, that is my name. I did that thing. Um, I also, so these are all of their names, because I was like, I'm not just going to not credit you. Um, I also worked with kids from the military village not too far from Maibuye, which was really incredible. And I loved doing this same thing with them. I used posters and I actually created coloring in things so that they could engage and they loved it. One of the things that I loved the most is, and I'll close on this, there's a young girl um, her name is Zibele, and I call her Prof Zibele because she's the one who always leads everyone. She's only seven years old, but you know, she said to me when we were busy making and she's coloring in, and then she goes, Pusha? And I'm like, Yes, Zizi, do you work here? And I was like, Yes, but I also do other things. And then she's like, Why don't you work here? And then I was like, But I told you, I do work here sometimes, Zibele. And then she was like, She looks around and then she goes, is it boring? <laughs> and I laughed and I laughed and I said, how oh, no, Zizimus, we're here making it entertaining. And she looked at me and she said, no, no, we're making it fun. And I was like, flip, exactly. That's my hope. I hope that kids come and that youth come. Imagine me, I'm getting old. That's why I'm saying youth. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, that's the end of that for now. Thank you. Thank you for reawakening us as well. <laughs>
just in terms of spatially, you know, in the context of the symposium format, that was really, really refreshing. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I am excited uh, to hear about George's uh, ongoing work and something that he hasn't um, shared too widely yet as it is a work in progress. But um, I'll let you continue, George. Cool. All right. Hi, guys. Um, I will start it how I started. Um, OK, we'll see. Uh, there it is. There oh, we go. OK, cool. So I haven't shared this yet, but let me start properly. I'm going to click through a lot of things. All right, cool. And it's out of order, but it's fine. Giritebo Omudimu, Jonjo, George Mahashe. Mahasha Beu Yawulobeidu. Gimugoni, Gimukalaga, Gido, Mudao Yamuvango, Gikedolo Kavat. My project generally comes from visiting, or rather not visiting, but a moment in time when I visited my grandmother, my great grandmother, a lot. Around 2007, just before the recession, South Africa grinds to a hold, or rather, business sort of grinds to a hold. I was a fashion photographer, extremely happy. One of my clients came to me with a book. Um, I think it was Photography of the Indian Ocean. Um, and, you know, they showed me a picture, an archival picture, and they're like, for our catalog, this is what we want. Um, it was an archival image that resembled some sort of anthropological format. Um, and from that moment, I then went home. Because then, just after that shoot, there was no more work. The photography, fashion photography industry changed. And where before you'd be say, they would say, George, we've got seven pages, what do you want to do? They would come with Vogue and they would be like, okay, cool, this is what we're doing. So for me at that moment, I exited fashion photography and spent two years visiting my grandmother. Okay, so maybe let me click through many, many, many images. What I've just read is this, and that is my Stagazello, which is my Gekeretokayes. Mm. So for me, the big archive starts when I start to visit my grandmother, when I start to go to funerals, when I start to go to weddings, where these names are recited. Um, I'm going to just, you know, click so that you can see, or maybe you can click for me. And are you yeah. comfortable with that? Just okay. go. All right. <laughs> so, I mean, this book I haven't shared widely yet because it's been too long. I heard it for a long time. But anyway, I would visit my grandmother, uh, my great-grandmother, and would go to all these places. And when I would go back to Joburg, I would then Google everything. You know, it's, that was like... 23, 24 at that time, I would Google everything. And of course, when you Google everything, all these words start to pop out. And for me, one of the first archive that at that point I didn't recognize as an archive that really helped me, and I don't even know its name. Um, on the internet, it was a repository of basically um, papers, photocopies from um, what I now know to be National Archives. Uh, basically, it was a map of Southern Africa pre-colonial. And around 2007, 2008, it's before the uh, research into pre-colonial Southern Africa was really taking on. So in those, I started finding references. Eventually, I find myself with Dagen Cronin. You can just keep, you know, there's too many things in here. Um, some of it we'll get to, some of it we want. And you know, I get to Dagen Cronin's images, which I also quite enjoyed as a photographer. As a fashion photographer, you're, teach, you're taught uh, visual literacy, but not critical literacy, right? So I had no concept of where 
um, Dagen Cronin was located. And then like the eager little child I was at that point, I decide I want an exhibition and I go to Kwezugule. I want an exhibition, I'm a world famous photographer. Mm -hmm. Give me an exhibition, he's like, what you got? And I show him my images and he's like, there's no criticality, have you ever heard of politics of the gays? And one of the images that's really important um, for my project, which is not in here, um, is an image of my great-grandmother making snuff, which is what you take. Um, it's my grandmother was a drug dealer, or my great-grandmother was a drug dealer, uh, literally. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'll tell you the story about snuff, the real snuff, not the one we buy at the shops. Um, anyway, so it was that photograph of her making snuff. And then another photograph that I photographed randomly. I saw an old woman who reminded me of what the old women looked like when I was a child. Um, dressed in traditional, or what we call traditional dress. Dressed in traditional dress with her cell phone tucked into a, um, a beaded case. So when you look at her, all you see is something that's five, hundred years old, but if you, you know, dig closer, you realize, you no, know, the t-shirt is, you know, ANC rally here. Mm -hmm. This, you know, towel is actually a replacement of a very complex uh, tapestry they used to make. So it's, it was a loaded image, but it was in black and white. Now that image is what got me, I guess, into the trouble of being um, accused, I guess, or rather informed that I was perpetuating a colonial gaze. And at that point, I had to understand what this colonial gaze is. And to, you know, I tell long stories, so I'm gonna try and quicken this one. So in order for me to understand what Kwesi had put on the table, you know, I, the solution was simple. Go use color photography, give people their proper names. You know, that should do the trick. Mm -hmm. But I then spent a lot of time with, um, anthropologists trying to understand what is this anthropological archive. I visited Museum Africa, which had quite a large collection of photographic archives. So then you see Dagen Cronin, you see Alien Grecha, who as an anthropologist I would later study. All of this goes on. A year later, I'm ready, you know, I've done the politics of the gaze. But that photograph of that woman with the title I'd used, Mulobedu, stuck with me. You know, I was like, I don't care what discourse says, this image remains as it is, with the title, no matter how much this titling has been abused, because for me, Mulobedu is a very, I could write 10 PhDs about just that one term. It's a language, it's, you know, it also means wizard, it also means destroyer of worlds, it's, it's a complicated uh, word, and for me to, associate that word with that woman was not about what Lobedu is now called a tribe. It was trying to excavate a language um, that was um, for me important. So I start with the prayer, I start with my names, but those names are also names of Balobedu that have lived in South Africa for almost 600 years. So for me, I think that's where the project starts. I think that's where, for me, the archive starts. But then there was the colonial archive, because once you start talking about the gays, you cannot avoid the anthropology archives. Mm -hmm. And I lost, I mean, I didn't lose, but I lost about five years of my life digging through anthropologists' archives, mm -hmm. who I eventually liked, which is a problematic position to be in. Um, but also I spent a lot of time researching um, and, uh, a trip that was taken by four of my great-great-grandparents to Berlin in 1897. So I spent quite a big uh, chunk of my time or early PhD research in Berlin in an archive. And for me, and I loved that you started your project like that. For yeah. me, after a few months there, I became very uncomfortable. I was becoming, I was getting to know the, um, the missionary more than I was getting to know you know, the people that went, and that really bugged me. And, you know, at that point, I ditched the colonial research, or rather, I, I ditched the archive. I was also very frustrated with how 
any discussion of photography. And I think maybe we need to like doop, 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 jump to like page 200. All right. Okay, this is like uh, 200, uh, a selection of about 6,000 photographs that has been ordered with a few text. Um, anyway, um, so at that point for me, I had to leave the archive and re-enter a different space. And at that point, I came across a mention of a dream. So this one woman had gone to Berlin and while in Berlin, she had had a dream that bothered the missionary so much that he had to write it. I never find the dream, but I do find another dream. And in this dream, this woman who had been, uh, who had refused to become Christian and had been running, out, and you must tell me if I'm taking too long. No, no, um, you Who had spent years, you know, gallivanting, having many husbands or many men, um, who refused to be a, a missionary's wife, because back then, if your husband had many wives and converted to mm -hmm. Christianity, second wife up, divorce, you become the missionary's wife. Um, she refused and went gallivanting. And she has a dream, and the dream basically tells her she must go back to um, the missionary. And of course, she has this dream just before one of the worst droughts that hit the area. Um, and she goes back and refuses to tell the missionary what she had dreamt, but rather pointed out that the dream instructed her to return and that's all that matters. So for me at that moment, dreams become a vehicle which all of a sudden I'm not thinking about the missionary. I'm trying to think about what does dream mean within my context. And at that point, for me, I realized that for Valobedu, the dreamscape was a place of many images, images that you are taught as a child. So there's a lot of image motifs that you are taught, but at the same time, little breadcrumbs about things to come. So another part that there's no room for at the moment is to also talk about prophecies, because um, the early prophets in Southern Africa dreamt of photography, dreamt of the internet. So the culture technically was ready for the photographic moment. So for me, at that point, I thought, okay, let me try dream. Okay, I tried dream and upon dreaming, I found a very weird relationship between the images that I was seeing or the images that I was making when I wake up. I think we might have passed where I was going, but we can stop here. Um, I would find, you know, I would have the images that I wake up to, but I was always troubled by the fact that there was always sound in the dream. So the sound was more important than the visuals. And at some point I started to realize that actually maybe my dreams are not visual in the way that I think. And then somebody was also telling me about how these uh, moments when you wake up, you convert a very complex sensory experience into a visual image. Uh, which for me was also quite um, an interesting. I'm, I'm going to fast forward because this is a lot of things I'm trying to a, to a, cycle it's through. It's okay, George. I think we it's, can pause there because in terms of the the what you, where you at in terms of the the dream uh, realm, dream space project, dreaming as a an embodied archive mm -hmm. that that relates very directly to your work as Molobed. Yes, so um, yeah. maybe if sure. I can close the loop. Sure. For me, what's important from that moment of encountering all those sources on the internet to the time I've spent in the colonial archive, you know, and I, I don't like to talk about it as much anymore because it, it's, a, it's a discourse in its own and everybody's versed in it so we can get lost in it. Mm -hmm. For me, what came out after all the research was how do I create an archive of my own? Because once, you know, after Kwesi said, go and find people's names, one of the things that kept coming when I went to show the people I photographed, the images, and, you know, they all tell me stories. And one of the stories that they told me was the moment of the anthropologists that lived in Bulobedu for two years, 
was a very important moment for Balobedu because they understood that a lot of what will come will be solved by what they inscribe into that colonial moment. So a lot of what came was that, yes, the anthropologist, yes, 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 yes. Mm. But this is what we put in there. Mm. And for me, at that point, she was like, if for, this was one of the women I spoke to, and she was like, what's important is for you to create your own map. Um, your own archive, and for me, what is in here, which is not as easy to see on screen, mm. is everything from images from my phone, more than 6,000 images from my phone of my travels, um, images from some of these archives, but also images from space, because one of the most interesting things that I learned about Vanuvedu is that they have moved over many, many, many centuries from uh, present-day Jerusalem side, all following a particular star that by some accounts is said to have fallen in, in, in what is now Moria. Wow. And this following would be tracked by eye, but also in the dreamscape. Mm. So usually when you dream of a particular star or you dream of a particular celestial body mm. which you know it's also crazy because you see it in your dream but unless you start like going through the archives of what the hubble telescope is bringing mm. you don't realize the correlation so for me what what really is important is for the next generation to be able to access my archive which mm. is the archive of my grandmother and the archive of everybody else. I need to find a way of packaging all that images into something. And I'll stop there. It's it's my second Amazing. time talking about this, so forgive the Amazing. That's it's madness. really generous of you to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amu, I think there is already a thread that you can pick up on um, in terms of your honours thesis, which I keep returning to, as I mentioned, because of what it um, uh, meant for me to think about the sonic in the archive. Um, so I'll let you speak to that, please. Thank you. Um, that was very interesting uh, to think through my own threads because I think I essentially started within the politics of the gays in um, this project that I did, which was an honors cause. So um, I was kind of preoccupied with the idea of sound and um, the encounter really, the first encounter of this preoccupation with sound is around 2016, 2017, 2018 um, with bomb music, electronic bomb music. Um, every December, you know, in South Africa, there's all sorts of different songs that come out and becomes a, a kind of um, sort of, you know, spectacle moment of December boss, um, yeah. which is yeah, very hard yeah, to articulate yeah, yeah, yeah. within. <laughs> a festive, um, highly yeah, intense yeah, festive period. Exactly. So, um, and then I, this, this was 2017 and 2018, I enrolled to... Um, be a student at the Center for Curating the Archive where George is currently um, convening. And um, the, you know, part of the program is encountering all sorts of um, museum objects, all sorts of galleries, all sorts of artistic and cultural production. And um, we went to the Kirby Collection, which is a music collection of about 600 musical instruments that were um, colonially collected. Um, until 1934. And so I was particularly interested in this drum, um, which is kind of titled quite perfunctorily Isgubu, um, but Isgubu is essentially a drum. Um, and this particular drum was said to be collected during the Bambata Rebellion um, in what was then the Natal colony. And so my interest was really thinking about how the encountering of this archive of about 600 plus um, musical instruments of um, indigenous people in South Africa, in Southern Africa, was the fact that it was silent. So this is a musical collection, this is a musical archive in a music school at GCT, but it is soundless. So that was very, um, 
kind of odd for me because it kind of rendered the the drum itself which has a particular utility of music soundless and subsequently silenced um, and continues to be silenced um, and soundless in terms of how it is even thought up thought about even in the contemporary mm. so um, my kind of modest intervention was to think through um, this kind of past, present, future oscillation of musical practices within Southern Africa and thinking through Isgubu as a kind of register and a technology to weave those historical pathways of the future, of the past, of the present, and thinking through um, the musical practice of electronic music, specifically Qom. Um, and so kind of thinking quite intergenerationally and thinking about the mobility of sound, the mobility of music, and the mobility of um, even kind of the politics of music as a form of resistance, granted the fact that this was allegedly um, collected from the Bambata Rebellion by um, an ethnomusicologist, Purvisal Kirby. So I kind of took this musical drum out of its archive for my exam. Um, because this is still quite, um, from an institutional point of view, mm. took it out of the archive, exhibited it um, as a part of my exam, playing different soundscapes that would kind of speak to um, music and kind of working through different producers who produce this kind of music. And what I found particularly interesting is the fact that their preoccupation with the archive was quite non-existent, but there is that kind of embodied methodology of understanding these musical practices outside of the artifacts, outside of the material culture that becomes essentialized um, within museums, within ethnomusicology. And so it became quite um, interesting to see those intergenerational um, discussions outside of the object itself. Mm. So that's kind of my first encounter, I would say, with um, a, a, an archive that triggered all sorts yeah. of interests in um, specifically sound and, and thinking about how do we enliven specific musical instruments that have been colonially collected and completely decontextualized and displaced. And silenced. And so I, I think it is important, this is an important aspect of your, of your sharing with us, which is uh, an experience, a six minute experience of a video that gives a sense of what the sound was that was in fact silenced until the contemporary moment of Qom. Uh, is this how I, yeah, there we go. Thank you.
Ryan, <laughs> do you mind stopping and pulling things, or at least lowering it all the way down? Thank you. You can pause it, yeah, thank you, thank you. Just in the interest of time, and to get more responses, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, I appreciate um, the positionality also of your work. Um, any uh, responses initially from within um, the participants, and then of course we'll open it up. In terms of any connections you've made um, amongst each other's work. Uh, um, for me, I think for me, um, what is interesting, particularly about your archive, is how many people within the family are called to address certain archival issues that would normally be mm. deferred to the state. Mm. Um, and I think for me, that's a very interesting position mm. for us to be in. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, that's just an observation that I think that's an important moment to recognize mm. within how in South Africa and actually elsewhere, mm. there's a way in which people within the families mm. are taking up certain position because it's not, you know, the fact that you're doing it, your mother is doing it, it's, it for me is, is, is an important thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of, of course. Um, just 
Thank you, George. Yeah, I, I hear that. And to be honest with you, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and my brain is going, going, going. It is because it's such an intimidating thing to be doing, to be honest, you know, in some ways. And initially when I ended up with this archive, I really, no one wants to be the one to do it. Mm. It's so much work. And that the more I started to engage a little bit with people who do do archiving, mm. practice things, all the fancy words that we love to throw in here, um, the more you learn, the more you go, sure, this is going to take forever. Which is why I found it helped when I started to go, okay, fine, this is not me doing this thing that I'm looking to get it done in five years' time. Instead, for me to go, okay, this mm. is life's work. Mm. Um, I will find many expressions for it, and I certainly will not be the only one working on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And even the idea of the Southern Women's Archive, for me, I think of it almost like a house. I'm building a home, you know. Um, Sis Wabala from Maibuye said something so interesting where she said, you know, we're still so young, mm -hmm. yet we just let people into our kitchens and our bedrooms and our panties before we've even had an opportunity to be mm -hmm. doing the work ourselves, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So for me, I go, okay, I've got the kids in this side. Mm -hmm. I've got in the bedroom, I know I've got this. In mm -hmm. the kitchen, I've got this. Mm -hmm. And sharing it in bits and giving myself permission. Mm -hmm. And just on that, just to say, I just wanted to thank everyone who's mm -hmm. spoken today because I found it so incredibly useful because um, it makes me go, it's okay to be doing it the way that you are doing it. That's right. Because all of us can be doing it the way that we are doing it. Yeah. And I was saying to Cody, you know, that was something that I tried to say to the students last week, every mm. time someone would come in, even with the question of what's an archive, mm. you know, to go, we're still figuring it out, which is wonderful. Mm. Add your voice now. Mm. Don't be scared. Mm. Do it now. Mm. I think a lot of the work that you all are doing is collapsing the uh, barriers uh, of temporality that I think people sometimes have to archives that it remains it's something that you're digging up something that is remains in the past and so by remobilizing uh, in um, also taking on the custodianship of your family archive in uh, sort of tracing the centuries long uh, uh, embodied uh, dream space that the Balube do, um, the work that they've been doing with about that, that kind of archive, uh, intergenerational archive, to then be willing to take that on to a future generation. Then this is a collapsing as well as what you're doing by thinking about a very contemporary genre of South African popular music, mm. which at, at its heart, and I hope the, in playing the video, you all felt the vibrancy mm. of gom. Mm. Uh, as you hear it in the phonetic of the word is how it is felt amongst a, a current generation of, of youngsters in South Africa. And again, it's returning them to the importance of the sound of the drum within Zulu culture, Zulu nation, and, and, and giving them access to that as its very own sort of removing it from the ethnographic silence, silencing that the ethnographic collection does. Um, any uh, questions from... Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. No, I Connie. also just wanted to say that something I've been, um, you know, thinking a lot about is the ways in which colonial archives, you know, we want alternative histories and content, but we also need alternative forms. So in looking at the different ways that these archives are conceived of, if you think of colonial archives as something that is an enclosure of information and it's supposedly complete and controlled um, and coherent, uh, I, 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 I'm often thinking about ways that we can um, change the content, but also the form. So what would an anti-colonial archiving practice look like? And I love the way you took the drum out of that museum, yeah. because the way that it's then displayed and put in there does render it soundless mm. um, and divorced from the Bambada rebellion mm. and the key issues around land struggles and colonization. Um, I work on a revolutionary papers project and um, there's so many similarities with the um, seismology and the 
past disquiet. Um, and some of the things that we're trying to do in that is break the silos between the artists and the archivists mm. and the activists mm. and between these past anti-colonial struggles and now, mm. as opposed to, well, it's post-colonial mm. and so now we can just put these on display and look back. Um, and so I think listening to the different forms that are used and engagement with the archives and insistence on you know, dreams or music mm. or um, multiple productions that come out of the archives um, is really an exciting. It opens up the imagination, even if none of us are necessarily going to do the thing, mm. the, the same thing. It means that there's that many more options and possibilities. So I appreciated all of the examples a lot. Uh, as a junior, I see. I would like us to, I mean, to get uh, whether there is a differentiation between indigenous knowledge systems and archiving. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so long that's a question to pose. I think a, a lot of what you, your work does is actually, George, contend with that. It's, it's, I don't think there is, I don't think there's a difference, right? Um, in a sense that on the one hand, we can say that a lot of, and then for me, I mean, this is my position informed by conspira what we like to call conspiracy theory around profits, mm. right? For me, I think what we like to call indigenous knowledge system already anticipates what we now call the colonial archive, meaning that whatever we call the colonial archive is to a degree a version of indigenous uh, knowledge systems. But at the same time, when I look at what you've done, right, there's a way in which the drum is there as a placeholder, but what the kids were doing, and I'll say the kids because these things come from people that are not bogged down by adult problems. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you know, what, what they do with Gupu in general automatically understands that what that drum was, during, was doing during the Bam Bata Rebellion, they're doing it using digital technologies mm. that were foreseen. So for me, I don't think there's a difference. I think these things are so entangled. Mm. But as Credo Muta usually says, it will take us a while to synchronize what we think is traditional and what is futuristic. Mm. And I mean, that's, so I don't have an answer. It's no longer discrete and separated. Uh, mm. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I don't think it's ever been. Okay. I don't think The it's, embodiment, right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. Sorry, yeah. No, okay. yeah. Interesting, but. Yeah. No, not at but, all, Yeah, Baba. that's an exciting <laughs> You've question. You've led us down a very specific path about the kind of methodologies that all four participants are interested in. And um, I'm wondering if anyone would like clarification because I, 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 I dare not trans translate the language and vocabularies of each project. Um, but I, if there is some form of understanding or knowledge about the subjectivity, the very specific subjectivity of each project um, or the kind of work that each uh, participant does, then we still have a few minutes in which we can speak to that. Does that make sense? No? Any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, firstly, thank you to all four of you, all five of you. Uh, it was uh, yeah, very lively and very informative. My question <laughs> does not speak to what you were saying. Um, it's. This was inspired uh, from the opening on, on, on Thursday uh, when Memo Sigala um, noted everything we, we, it, that we were doing um, and the exhibit and then uh, posed the question of where are the children? Um, and to me, the purpose of these archives and um, taking these things in, in the context and bringing them back with dignity mm. is to actually help restore the dignity of our people. and. The most important phase of this, I believe, is when your personhood is forming. Mm. 
uh, because by now, now that I'm 31, I've had to do all that work myself, and you know, it's less impactful now. So how do we take this knowledge um, and take to the people uh, and with the context, like you know, helping these kids make these um, protest uh, posters, how do we bring it back to people who it really matters to most? Yeah, of course. Mm. For me, I would say by using the opportunities that I have. Mm. Um, so, for example, being at my way and knowing that I'm doing this thing, but then again, I said, since Babala made the offer to say, do you want to curate something for 76? I could have easily just been like, no, I don't know how to do that, you know, mm -hmm. but instead just to take the opportunity and to give it a go and to try. And often what that then leads to in my line of thinking and work anyway, is that it leads to play. And for me, play is where everything can happen, mm -hmm. in my opinion anyway. Um, again, because that is my work. Mm -hmm. But I found that it is through the playing that then we're given an opportunity to engage, then to impart knowledge, let's say, mm -hmm. but without making the kids feel like, no, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that I loved was then listening to students walking out and hearing them engaging, you know, and going, you know, in 2015 I was actually this old. Do you know what happened that time? Da, 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 da. Mm. And to hear them talking amongst themselves, for them to return to the archive and take selfies, you know, and be mm. proud and be excited and to understand that they are adding to the archive now, is what mm. I said to them. We don't know, 30 years from now, other students can also come in and then be looking at your work from this moment now. Mm, mm. Yeah. And come in via the selfies. Because I think for me the, the selfie moment is quite yeah. interesting when yeah. they yeah. enter the archive in it the is. sense that they are taking that archive that you've opened and then taking it to their generation in ways we don't have yeah. the, the sensibility say, to do it. On that, also giving them the I found that my saying, starting off by saying, know that you are going to be adding to this yeah. gallery. Mm -hmm. You are now officially an artist. Just that act of them being a kid who's four years old, tabo, man pincha, etc., etc., four years old, let's say. Yeah. The pride in that. Then going back home and going, Mama, I drew something, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, is wonderful and I found that with the village in particular I've heard you know yeah. stories about how it was very divided but because of these workshops and because kids were playing mm -hmm. suddenly you're finding auntie so-and-so and auntie so-and-so who have not spoken in ages mm -hmm. are willing to now mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Prof Zibele is leading them yes exactly <laughs> for your old Prof Zibele yes. I, I yeah. also find I mean um, that we often underestimate what young people would be interested in if given the opportunity. Mm. So yeah. like in a lot of the workshops with activists and with uh, different collectives and with students, if you give them the original of these anti-colonial periodicals mm. and these journals, um, they are interested. And in those journals, there's not the same silos. There's the poetry, there's political minutes, there's photography, there's news, there's politics. Mm. Um, and so to give those uh, materials that can speak for themselves in a way yeah. um, and to create spaces where they can be given those materials. Um, I know there's this quote about the role of the cultural workers to make revolution irresistible and it's been tweaked. If you look at, up online it will say the role of the artist and I, I'm so curious at what point did those words get shifted because cultural workers and I, I wasn't here on Thursday, but I think there was some talk about Medu and cultural yes, workers. Yes, of course. Yeah. In the, in and and the approach crowd, yeah. of, we should all be a, approaching our work as cultural workers, mm. as historians or as artists, where the line between the politics and the other forms of labor mm. and reading and, um, and circulation of ideas and materials, it doesn't have to be like, now this is the fun time and now you're in class and you're going to read mm. something somebody mm. else wrote as the authority on that. That's but right. I think creating those opportunities, um, so surprising mm -hmm. that you can actually spark that kind of 
very nerdy radical joy quite yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, look, we were invited to the museum. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And also, can I say, the yeah. discovery, what you were speaking about, about the colonial archive and going through that and then indigenous systems, etc., etc. I find that, for me, one of the most exciting things, I brought some sources here that I'm not going to have time to talk about now, but one of the most exciting things for me in starting this work as a young person is going, what? So blikey? actually bothered to translate Julius Caesar into Julius Caesara, yeah, yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. Bantu education, exactly. what does that mean for me? Yeah. Then going, what? Makeke was there in 1903 but chose to go to Wilberforce University and was taught by W.E.B. Du Bois or was taught by, um, sorry, all the names are going like this now. But all of those discoveries yeah. then place me yeah. as a black woman maker. And mm. I go, yeah, so we've been rocking this thing for ages, actually. Mm. 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 Yeah. I think it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nancy, I think on that note, like there are so many, or unless, um, is any more questions? Yeah, this has been a really exciting discussion. Um, and it leads us in different directions mm. simultaneously. Uh, where archive, we hold on to an idea of archive as something that does the work of recovery, mm. uh, especially when there's been erasure. Um, and we we work with archive as something that needs to be made more accessible and more people need access to it. But I'm also hearing that there's a danger of archive and archiving and archivalities of extending governmentality and extending um, the, the ways that we need to be regularized and made governable. Mm. So I want to, to come back to Kony's question, which is about how do, you, how do you think about archive in a post-colonial manner? Mm -hmm. Does that lead you to something that we might be able to call the post-archive? Interesting. Mm -hmm. I think can I? Yeah. I think for me, um, it was interesting to think about interpolation as a framework. So, um, how things are so intertextual. Um, and of course, beginning with Isgubu, but Isgubu within our many um, Nguni, I'd say Nguni, but also Southern African cultural practices holds different kinds of archives. Um, that are, of course, outside of the colonial archive, but also situated within spiritual practices, situated within popular music, situated within merrymaking in its vast forms. Um, and so the mobility of the archive also becomes important in thinking of this idea of getting out of the objects, getting out of the artifacts, um, and thinking through a kind of dynamic way of temporality, which is something that you brought up, Tato, in the beginning of our, our discussion, that these things are not stagnant. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we think about them within that framework, that they will constantly be dynamic. Mm -hmm. And so even in the question of um, how do we bring young people to kind of think through these ideas, it's also by, you know, being in, t in tune, tapping in and, and taking seriously what young people are doing, what young black people are doing um, as a very important way to kind of think through the future, think through progress. Um, and I think that becomes some form of a methodology, some form of a speculation, dreams, mm -hmm. um, informing that perpetual curiosity um, of there's more, mm -hmm. you know? And I think even thinking about uh, the Bambata rebellion, because the situatedness of the drum is of course a context of resistance, mm -hmm. which is still um, kind of a resonating um, thematic in our lives in mm. KZN, in South Africa, mm. in the world. So it's clearly the work is still perpetual, it's still, it still has to be done. So I think in how we think about archives, it's also kind of moving within 
outside of the linearity of time and, and moving with, a, with some form of dynamicism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Hey. Connie, anyone else want to respond to that question? I, I could, I also saw a hand up. Yeah, we will take yeah. a few. Go ahead. No, no, it was just that for me, p picking up on this, there is what the government wants to do with the archive. But yeah. I think what's most important is what are people doing with archives, because I don't think government has enough resources mm. to keep up with what the general public can uh, produce. And for me, I think some of what was um, shared earlier today speaks to the role of those mm. uh, public or rather none, I mean, maybe they may not even put words in other people's mouth. Mm. But for me, there's something about what the contemporary person is able to generate mm. that government cannot keep up mm. with, just in terms of, um, when I think about, I work with some high school kids, the amount of images and, 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 and archive, what we would call archival fragments that they are producing that will be accessible to us in a later time far exceeds mm. what we are able to do at Iziko, at UCT, and so forth. So I think for me, that might be one way of addressing mm. that problem. Because it is a real problem. Yeah. It is, mm. it's a serious problem. Thank you. Uh, Maybe Always just from Christine, for sure. Yeah, just a couple of things. First, I want to thank everyone who spoke. It's, these projects are so exciting and inspiring. Um, and maybe just a quick response in thinking about the role of government and archives. Um, I mean, so much of the work that you're all doing is producing new archives, researchers' archives, collections, um, and there are alternative archives all over the world, right? We're not, in so many of these cases, we're not dependent on national archives. We're lucky if we get into them sometimes, right? There's so many barriers to entry to access very official archives. Sometimes it's easier than one thinks. Sometimes it's impossible and uh, very uh, strategically uh, meant so that people cannot access them. But I think this is where mm -hmm. this work of activating this and telling these stories, you, I mean, archives are primary source material. They are not the story. They're yeah. elements to tell the story. Yeah. So when people, to be careful to say that the archive is history, it is the material, the raw material to tell the histories. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's so much subjectivity required in doing that. And um, to note that there are guerrilla initiatives, right? People who digitize and put stuff online. I mean, there's so many different ways in which people are trying to make accessible and what does access, access really mean, I think is something to think about really critically. Um, but there's so many different kinds of initiatives, whether they're grassroots organizations, individuals that have built their own collections and trying to make them publicly available. Uh, to people who are guerrilla putting up, you know, thousands of hours of footage online that maybe otherwise people would be unable to access and really all over the world. So mm. I think the problem is that there's so much to look at that, you know, that's the biggest challenge. Um, but the work is the work to find what we're looking for to dig um, without it being a discovery in an archive. And we are new kind of discoverers, I think, yeah. you know being very careful around that language is, is something that's important and that things are waiting um, under dusty boxes to be, you know, to yeah. be discovered. But in fact, it is the work of activating and meaning making. That's what all of you are doing that makes this so meaningful to everyone. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you. That's incredibly um, incisive and precisely how the note I was going to end on. <laughs> to some degree, I was going to um, end on the, sim uh, the simple note that there is a lot of radical engagement, um, a lot of radical imagining as well. Um, there's a narrative and effective um, and critical of, of like um, refusals um, in the ways in which you all uh, uh, all have in previous and current and ongoing projects uh, have pursued archival interests or, or pursued uh, investigations. Um, there's also a beautiful um, personal uh, uh, place from which you shared uh, with us today. So I really uh, thank you for taking up my singular prompt to uh, think about one moment in which the archive really shifted something for you at a very, uh, a much deeper level than was anticipated. So thank you for sharing and I hope um, everyone has enjoyed 
uh, the dynamic nature of this cohort. Thank you.